<laughs> You're presently in Germany, is that right? Hello, do you hear me? Uh, we didn't hear you for a while, but now I hear you. Uh, yeah, okay, so we are saying it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce you. Uh, you know, from the deal, but you are presently in Germany, is it? No, no, I'm currently at McGill. Oh, oh okay. I'm leaving on Sunday for Switzerland. Oh, I see, Switzerland. Okay. We were feeling sorry for you, thinking that you were staying up late to do this. No, we no, it's talk. only one hour time difference. Uh, we can stop feeling sorry for you. Anyway, it's a great pleasure to introduce you and uh, look forward to your talk on emergent cosmology from matrix theory. Great. So thanks a lot for the invitation to speak. And I'm sorry I can't be present in person. Um, so as you know, the inflationary scenario is the current paradigm of early universe cosmology. And inflation is usually analyzed using an effective field theory technique. Uh, excuse me, the volume is rather low. Is this something you can control or I, I should control? Uh, the the volume uh, is very low. I can hardly Perfect. hear you. It's perfectly fine here. Um, yeah. Hmm. Okay, sorry for the interruption. That seems to be on your end. So from the others, is it okay? Yeah, I, I, we, can, we can hear you, yes. Good, good. So anyway, I'm going to argue in the first half of this talk that effective field theory descriptions of the early universe, in particular rapidly expanding universe, faces important conceptual problems. And these are problems which are independent of string theory. These are unitarity problems and inconsistency with the second law of thermodynamics. So I'll try to persuade you that therefore we need to look beyond an effective field theory framework if we want to describe the very old universe. So and if I'm successful in persuading you of this, then I'll tell you about an attempt to look beyond an effective field theory description. And this is a matrix theory cosmology, where here we start with the Banks, Fischler, uh, Susskind, and Schenker matrix model, which is a proposed non-perturbative superstring, um, and proposed non-perturbative model for superstring theory. And we will try to extract cosmology from that. So that's the motivation. So the outline of the talk is first, I will try to convince you that we have problems if we try to describe the early universe cosmology using effective field theory methods. Then I will remind you that there's not just one scenario for early universe cosmology, which can reproduce the data that we observe. There are a number of successful early universe models. And then I will show you that there's a way to get fluctuations that explain what we see today of thermal origin. So I will show you the formalism, how to compute density perturbations and gravitational waves starting from thermal initial fluctuations in the context of some emergent cosmology. And then I will present to you this attempt to construct emergent cosmology from matrix theory. And please do interrupt me as I go on. So first topic is the problems of an effective field theory description of the early universe. And here, what I have is a space-time plot of inflationary cosmology. So the vertical axis is time. The horizontal axis is physical spatial extent. And uh, the timeline corresponds to an inflationary cosmology. So there is a big bang. Then there's a phase of inflation, exponential expansion of space. And then there's a phase transition to the usual standard big bang phase of expansion. So this is a timeline. And here on this graph, I'm showing you various scales. So first of all, 
I'm showing you the causal horizon, which is the distance that could have been in causal contact from the Big Bang. And during the phase of inflation, when space expands exponentially, the horizon expands exponentially. Now, the solid blue line is a different length scale. It's called the Hubble radius or Hubble horizon. And that is simply the inverse expansion rate. And if space expands exponentially, the expansion rate is constant, and therefore the Hubble horizon is constant. And the third length scale is the physical length associated with structures that we observe today. For example, the structure that corresponds to galaxy clusters or the scale that corresponds to the quadrupolar microwave background and so on. And uh, these are density perturbations with constant co-moving length and therefore their physical length expands proportional to the scale factor. And so in the phase of inflation, the physical wavelength associated with any scale expands exponentially. So the success of inflation is in part due to the fact that scales that we observe today on very large cosmological scales originate inside the Hubble radius at the beginning of inflation. But 20 years ago, Jean Martin and myself pointed out that there's a problem with this diagram because there's another length, there's a length scale of a breakdown of effective field theory, which is the Planck length or the string length. And as shown in this diagram, if inflation lasts only a little bit longer than it has to in order to be successful, then all scales that we observe today start out with a wavelength smaller than the Planck length at the beginning of inflation. So they start out in the regime where we can't trust the theory that we use to calculate the fluctuations. So we argued 20 years ago that effective field theory breaks down and that therefore new physics must be taken into account when computing observables from inflation. Now, uh, two and a half years ago, Bedroya and Waffa, after hearing these arguments, they postulated a conjecture based on this analysis. And they postulated that no physical model coming from an ultraviolet complete theory of gravity can have the feature that transplanking modes exit the Hubble radius. So if we describe our space time using standard Friedman Robertson Walker parameterization, so this is physical time, these are my co moving coordinates, this is a scale factor. H is the expansion rate. The Hubble radius is the inverse expansion rate. So the Transplankian censorship conjecture of Beroy and Waffa states that if you start at any initial time P sub i with the Planck length, and you expand this Planck length to some later time P sub r, that you have to remain smaller than the Hubble radius at this later time. So what I'm circling with my cursor is the formulation of the Transplankian censorship conjecture. So why should we believe such a conjecture? And I'll give you three reasons. The first reason is, um, with apologies to Chris, uh, in analogy with Penrose's cosmic censorship conjecture. So when I say apologies to Chris, this is the uh, Cambridge-Oxford uh, debate and I'm definitely on the Cambridge side, Chris, so don't get me wrong. So um, this is a space-time diagram of a black hole with charge smaller than a mass. And there's a singularity in the center of the black hole, but the observer far out is hidden from the bad things that might happen at the center of the black hole by a horizon. Now, general relativity admits solutions with charge greater than the mass. And for those solutions of general relativity, the observer far away from the center of the black hole would not be shielded from the bad stuff that happens at the singularity. So what Penrose postulated is that even though the effective field theory, which is general relativity, admits such pathological solutions, the complete, the 
ultraviolet completion of the theory will prohibit such solutions. So the ultraviolet completion will shield external observers from singularities and non unitarities and they'll shield it by a horizon. So let's translate Penrose to cosmology. And the translation scheme is the following. Position space becomes a momentum space. The black hole singularity becomes the space of transplanting modes. And the black hole horizon is replaced by the Hubble horizon. So Penrose's cosmic censorship conjecture translated to cosmology therefore means that an observer measuring only super Hubble modes must be shielded from the transplanted modes by the Hubble horizon. So now why should we take the Hubble horizon? Now, um, the reason for that is that the Hubble horizon, the Hubble radius, it differentiates scales where fluctuations only oscillate. This is sub Hubble modes from modes which, which are super Hubble and modes which squeeze, which freeze out, they become squeezed and they can classicalize. And so if we demand that it is the classical region that is insensitive to the transplanted region, then we see why we should use the Hubble horizon. Okay, so this is my first justification for why one should accept something like the transplanted censorship conjecture. Now, let me turn to the second um, argument. And the second argument relates to the non-unitarity of effective field theory in an expanded universe. And this is something that was discussed by Nathan Weiss already in 1985. And it was recently resurrected by Kotler and Strominger in a paper that appeared in January. So in an effective field theory analysis, you say that the Hilbert space is a product Hilbert space of harmonic oscillator Hilbert spaces. One harmonic oscillator Hilbert space for each co-moving wave number. Now in an effective field theory description, you also have to have an ultraviolet cutoff. And this ultraviolet cutoff has to be fixed physical scale. Now to maintain fixed physical scale ultraviolet cutoff, in an expanded universe, you have to continuously create modes, and this is non-unitarity. So if we demand that the classical region be insensitive to this non-unitarity, then again, we get the conclusion that a um, good model should not have transplanting modes ever except the Hubble horizon. So now before turning to the third justification for the transplant consensual conjecture, I will discuss the application to inflation. So this is a space-time diagram for inflation that you've already seen. So time, a vertical axis, space, horizontal axis. The curve that I'm tracing out with my cursor now is the Hubble horizon, the Hubble radius. This is the Planck length. This is the beginning of inflation. This is the end of inflation. This is the present time. And the way that I've drawn this space-time diagram is in a way that the transplant and censorship conjecture is marginally satisfied. So a mode which is Planck length at the beginning of inflation can grow exactly to be equal to the Hubble radius at the end of inflation. So inflation cannot last any longer than I've drawn. So the TCC sets an upper bound on the duration of inflation. However, if inflation is to be phenomenologically successful, then scales that we observe today in the microwave background, they have to be sub-Hubble at the beginning of inflation. Otherwise, we lose the causal generation mechanism. And again, I've shown this condition that the current horizon is mapped onto the Hubble radius at the beginning of inflation. I've mapped this as marginally satisfied. So you see that demand in that inflation is phenomenologically successful. 
that sets a lower bound on the duration of inflation. So you have an upper bound on the duration of inflation from the TCC, a lower bound from demanding that inflation is phenomenologically successful. Now, whether these bounds are consistent depends on where this Hubble radius is located relative to the Planck length. The lower the energy scale of inflation, the larger the Hubble radius is during inflation, and the easier it is to satisfy both of these criteria. And so this is how the mathematics works. This is the upper bound on the duration of inflation from the TCC. You demand that the Planck length at the beginning of inflation can grow only to less or equal to the Hubble radius at the end of inflation. And this is a condition that inflation is phenomenally successful, that the current Hubble radius is mapped back at the beginning of inflation to something which is smaller than the Hubble radius at the beginning of inflation. So you do the mathematics and you find that there's an upper bound on the energy scale of inflation of which results, which is approximately this value. So this is many orders of magnitude lower than the energy scale of simple models of inflation. And if you have an inflationary model which satisfies this constraint, then the primordial amplitude of gravitational waves becomes utterly negligible. So the famous tensor to scalar ratio, the amplitude of gravitational waves divided by the amplitude of uh, cosmological perturbations, becomes smaller than 10 to the minus 30, which means that secondary tensors become dominant. So you see that this means that uh, standard simple inflation is inconsistent with the TCC. For late time cosmology, it means that dark energy cannot be a bare cosmological constant. Okay, so there are ser serious implications for inflationary cosmology. So now let me turn to the third justification for the trans Planckian censorship conjecture. And this is an entanglement entropy argument. So let's consider the entanglement entropy between sub and super Hubble modes. Similarly to how people in black hole physics consider the entanglement between um, um, degrees of freedom which are outside of the horizon with degrees of freedom which are inside of the horizon. Now, if we have a phase of inflationary expansion, then the phase space of super Hubble mode grows and that leads to an increase in the entanglement entropy. And if we demand that the entanglement entropy at the end of inflation is smaller than the thermal entropy density that we have in the radiation dominated phase. So if we demand that the second law of thermodynamics is satisfied, then we get an upper bound on the duration of inflation. And you essentially get the same bound on the duration of inflation which falls from the TCC. Okay, now I want to emphasize that uh, what I spoke about so far is completely independent of string theory. Now, as you probably know, there are also con constraints on inflation from string theory. This is the Swampland program. There's a vast landscape of effective field theories. Any space time dimension goes, any number of fields goes, any shape of the potential goes, any field range is okay. But superstring theory, rather than allowing anything, is extremely constraining. Only a very small subset of all effective field theories is consistent with string theory. The rest line the swampland. So you have this huge swampland of effective field theories, and only a small set of little islands is consistent. And what are the conditions for these habitable islands sticking out of the swamp? Well. If a scalar field li lies in this island, then the range of field values for which this effective field theory can be used is smaller than a Planck mass. And potential for these scalar fields are either sufficiently uh, steep or sufficiently tachyonic. And when I say sufficient, it is always in Planck units. Okay, so these are the criteria. 
And obviously these criteria mean that you can't have canonical single field inflation. You can't have eternal inflation. They cannot be a bare cosmological constant. And um, well, even quintessence, meaning dark energy described by a scalar field is starting to be constrained. So hopefully I've persuaded you that there are serious problems for an effective field theory analysis for any expanding universe, in particular for an expanding universe where the expansion rate is, where the, where the universe expands exponentially. So now comes the second point. There are other scenarios for successful early universe cosmology which do not involve inflation. So this is the one data slide that I want to show. This is the angular power spectrum of cosmic microwave background anisotopies. So the vertical axis is power. The horizontal axis is angular scales. And uh, the black dots are the measurements from uh, WMAP. And you see that on small angular scales, you have some uh, statistical errors. On large angular scales, you have a systematic uncertainty. And then there's an artist who drew this red curve which fits the data quite well. And this artist was given six parameters to fit the data. And I want to tell you who the artists were. And the artists were Zeldovich and Zunyayev back in 1969, 1970, and Peebles and you, also in the same time, which is 10 years before inflation. And here I stole a graph from the Zeldovich Zunyayev paper. So vertical axis is time. Horizontal axis is my co-moving coordinates. And what Zeldovich and Zunyayev argued is that, oh, no, there's something else that I forgot to say. This time here is a time when the microwave background is released, the time of recommendation. And this diagonal line is the standard Big Bang horizon, the Hubble horizon. And uh, at times uh, later than the time of recombination, it's replaced by the genes like. So what Zeldovich and Zanayev argued is the following. They knew that there are density perturbations that form galaxies, that explain the distribution of galaxies, and they knew that these density perturbations had a roughly scalar variance spectrum. So they said, let's just assume that there are some roughly scalar variance spec uh, perturbations which are present in the early universe on super Hubble scales. They will be sitting there as standing waves until the length scale becomes smaller than the Hubble radius. So we catch them at maximal extent when they enter the Hubble radius and then they start to oscillate. So the wave which enters the Hubble radius right at recombination, we catch it at maximal extent. This wave here, we catch when it's done a quarter of an oscillation when it's a local minimum, a local velocity maximum, and so on. And this diagram illustrates the origin of these acoustic oscillations in the angular power spectrum. So this is the length scale that enters the Hubble radius right at recombination. This is a length scale that has done a quarter of an oscillation. This one has done half an oscillation and so forth. So these acoustic oscillations in the microwave background were predicted and well understood 10 years before inflation. And you see this graph is figure 1A, that's figure 1B. Figure 1B shows the power spectrum of mass perturbations as a function of wave number. And these oscillations give rise to the baryon acoustic oscillations in the galaxy uh, power spectrum. So baryon acoustic oscillations, acoustic oscillations in the CMB angular power spectrum were well understood 10 years before inflation. So before telling you about the criteria for successful early universe cosmology, I have to emphasize again the difference between Hubble radius and horizon. So the horizon is the forward light cone of a point on the initial Cauchy surface. It's the 
the distance which expands exponentially during inflation, it tells you about causal contact. The Hubble radius is a local concept. It differentiates between scales where fluctuations oscillate and scales where fluctuations are frozen in, squeezed, and classicalized. In standard big bang cosmology, Hubble radius is equal to horizon, and therefore you have a horizon problem. So now I can turn to my criteria for a successful early universe cosmology. Now, criterion one is the horizon has to be much bigger than the Hubble radius in order to explain the overall isotopy of the microwave back. And then if you want to causally produce uh, fluctuations, and when I say causally produce, I mean in a finite time interval, we want to move around matter to produce the fluctuations, then we need the fluctuations to originate inside the Hubble radius at, an early, at early times. And finally, if you satisfy the first two criteria, you also have to get the scaling invariant spectrum. So these are three criteria for successful early universe cosmology and inflation indeed is the first scenario which was proposed, which using causal physics can realize all of these three criteria. So this is the space-time diagram that you've already seen twice. Time, space, this is a period of exponential expansion, inflation. And what this does is it inflates the horizon exponentially compared to the Hubble radius. Criterion one satisfied. Scales that we observe today, their wavelengths are exponentially diluted. If you go back in time during inflation, they originate sub-Hubble at the beginning of inflation. Criterion two satisfied. And since the energy density is constant during inflation, the local physics is time translation invariant. And that is the origin for the scale invariant spectrum of fluctuations. So inflation indeed is a first model which satisfies all of the three criteria and which produces the angular power spectrum, which I showed you. But it is not the only one. Here's a second scenario. This is a bouncing cosmology. So here we assume that the scale factor as a function of time is as follows. You start in a contracting phase, then there's new physics, which needs a description beyond effective field theory. And you have a direct transition, transition to usual standard big bang expansion. So this is the postulate that is made in a bouncing cosmology. And the resulting space-time graph is what I show here. So time, a vertical axis, space, my co-moving coordinates, horizontal axis. These diagonal curves are the Hubble radius, Hubble horizon. In the contracting phase, the Hubble horizon is shrinking. In the expanding phase, it's increasing. Time runs from minus infinity to plus infinity, so the horizon is infinite. Cartier one satisfied. You see here from this plot that all scales that we observe today start out sub-Hubble if you go back sufficiently far into the past. Criterion two satisfied. And well, if you take fluctuations that emerge as vacuum fluctuations in the far past, and if they exit the Hubble radius in a matter-dominated phase of contraction, then indeed you get a scaling effect spectrum of curvature perturbations at the time of the bounce. And you have to accept this last claim that I made. I can convince you of that in the question session. So the third scenario, the one that I will actually be showing an implementation of is the emergent scenario. And here we assume that there's an early phase. Maybe there's not even a conventional space-time description of this early phase, but I will here model it as a static phase. And then there's a phase transition do the usual radiation phase of standard Big Bang cosmology. So this is a postulate that I'm making for the emergent universe. And the result in space-time diagram is given by this. So time, vertical axis, space, horizontal axis. Here I drew uh, physical spatial coordinates. Uh, this is the emergent phase, quasi-static. This is a standard big bang phase of expansion. 
the blue curve is the Hubble radius. And if the universe is static, quasi-static, then the Hubble radius is infinite. If the universe is static, then, well, time doesn't make, might not be, even make sense, but there's causality information over the entire space. So criterion one satisfied. And you see here that criterion two is satisfied as well. Fluctuations that we observe today, they start out sub hubble at the beginning in the emergent phase. And uh, well, how do we get scale around fluctuations from this? I will postpone the answer to that for a little bit. Okay, so um, key point is that there's more than one early universe scenario with which we can explain the data. Good. So now, how do we obtain inflation and how do we obtain a bouncing cosmology? So we usually assume that space time is described by general relativity and matter is described by a scalar field because we require pressure smaller than minus one third the energy density to get inflation. So we use effective field theory to obtain inflation. So if we want inflation, then we need the potential energy of the scalar field to dominate. Therefore, the scalar field has to be slowly rolling. And therefore, the, curve, the slope of the potential has to be very small. And if we want inflation to be an attractor in initial collision space, then the scalar field has to roll over large distances. So we need a very shallow potential, and we need the scalar field to roll over large distances. And you see, this is again, um, in, obviously inconsistent with the swamp by criteria. Good, so, uh, and you see that uh, this is uh, constrained by the transplant constitutional conjecture. So inflation might be correct, but if we want to obtain inflation, we need to go beyond an effective field theory description. Now there are constructions of inflation which go beyond an effective field theory description. For example, by Giad Valley and collaborators, they obtain inflation as a condensate of gravitons about Minkowski space time. And there's also a uh, McGill uh, collaboration, Keshav Kaskup, Dal, including Roger Tata, and they obtain inflation as a coherent state in string theory. And here are the references. Okay, so what about obtaining a bouncing cosmology using um, effective field theory? That also has problems. So, okay. <clears throat> so if we stick to Einstein, to the Einstein Hilbert description of gravity, then if we want a bouncing scenario, which has no initial condition problem, then we need this bouncing scenario to involve a phase of very slow contraction. And we get that by having matter with equation of state W much bigger than one. W is pressure divided by energy density. And this is assumed, this is obtained by assuming that matter is dominated by a scalar field with negative exponential potential. So the advantage of this ecparotic scenario is anisotropies are diluted. You obtain spatial flatness and you have a global attractive initial condition space. And for, from the point of view of string theory, negative exponential potentials are ubiquitous in string theory. And the reason is that ADS is the stable ground state of string theory. And so if you approach ADS, using effective field theories, you will have negative potentials. And if you use something like then the potentials are going to be exponential, exponential potential for the canonically normalized field. Okay, but again, if you want to get a bounce, you have to go beyond the standard effective field theory description. So, so the crucial challenge for bouncing cosmologies is you need to go beyond an effective field theory description to get the bounce and to successfully calculate observables. And to whet your appetite, um, 
we've recently shown that we can add one new degree of freedom to the low energy effective field theory action. One new degree of freedom motivated by string theory, which solves all of these three problems at one go. And this is the S brain. So I'm looking at the clock here. I think I still have a little bit of time. Uh, so what we've uh, done is we've uh, used the uh, argument that if the energy density approaches a string scale, then many new string degrees of freedom become low mass, comparable in mass to the other degrees of freedom, and they have to be introduced, included in the low energy effective action. So if we want to write down an effective action, which um, starts with the effective action, which is used to get the contracting phase. So einstein Hilbert action, the scalar field that gives this contraction. This effective action breaks down once you hit the string scale. So let's add an extra term, which is present exactly at the time when you hit the string scale. And it is a relativistic object by, given by a certain tension. And this is what I call the S brain. So now, the S brain has zero energy density. And since it's a positive tension, it has negative pressure. And so there, therefore, this object has the criteria which allow a transition between contraction and expansion. And if this tension is sufficiently large, and the usual matching conditions for the background uh, give you a successful transition between contraction and expansion. So bottom line is for inflation, you need to go beyond an effective theory description. Also for a bouncing cosmology, you have to go beyond an effective field theory description. But what I'm going to explore in the rest of the talk is an emergent cosmology. And what I want to show you now is how to compute observables in a emergent cosmology. And I'll first explain this in a toy model of emergent cosmology, which goes back to prehistoric times before the invention of the archive. So it is string gas cosmology, where we assume, where we took space time to be some given uh, object and matter in this space time is a gas of fundamental strings, not a gas of fundamental particles. And we wanted to make use of the new degrees of freedom and new symmetries that uh, this starting point has. So if you go from particles to strings, then you have oscillatory modes and winding modes, not just the momentum modes. And the oscillatory modes lead to the fact that the gas of closed strings has a maximum temperature. So, and um, the fact that you have winding modes leads to a new symmetry, namely the T-duality symmetry. So the center of mass motion of strings on this compact space of radius R are quantized in units of one over R, but the energy of momentum modes is quantized in, of winding modes is quantized in units of R. So the T-duality symmetry in this simple example is R goes to one over R in string units and an M are interchanged. The mass spectrum of string states is unchanged. The vertex operators obey the symmetry. And if the symmetry uh, is a symmetry at the non perturbative level, then you get the existence of D brains. All of you know this better than I do, but what does that imply for cosmology? So if we take a gas of closed strings, on this compact space, closed heterotic strings, and we plot the temperature of this gas as a function of the size of the box, then we get this bell-shaped curve. So we start at large size, the energy is in the momentum modes, the box shrinks, the momentum modes get heavier, temperature rises, you reach, you approach the string scale, and now you can create the uh, moment, the um, oscillatory modes, the energy goes into the oscillatory modes. Once the radius becomes smaller than one in spring units, the energy can flow into the winding modes 
the temperature can decrease. So now you see that if we imagine that our description of physics starts in this Hagedorn phase, this looks like something that's a quasi-static phase. So based on this picture, we postulated this evolution of a scale factor. And this early universe phase is a thermal gas of strings. So if we want to make contact with observations, okay, then we have to compute how the fluctuations, the thermal fluctuations in this emergent phase translate into curvature fluctuations and gravitational waves. So this is what we are doing in, this is what we uh, managed to uh, calculate in this paper. So the method of calculating observables from emergent cosmology is the following three-step procedure. We take the correlation functions of matter in the emergent phase. Then for any co-moving scale, we will convert the matter fluctuations to metric fluctuations at the time when the scale crosses the Hubble radius. So let me go back a couple of slides, or one slide. So in this scenario, we will go in, go, we will study this emergent phase. We will start, we will calculate the matter fluctuations in this emergent phase. And if we take this scale K, then at the time when this scale exits the Hubble radius right at the end of the emergent phase, we will use the perturbed, the linearized Einstein equations on this scale to convert matter fluctuations into metric fluctuations. So this is the procedure. And then in the uh, standard Big Bang cosmology phase, we will evolve the metric fluctuations using usual general theory. So this is the three-step procedure. Okay, now the matter correlation functions are given by the partition functions in the emergent phase. So all we need to compute observables starting from string theory is the string theory partition function. Here in this toy model, the string gas partition function. So we have the string gas partition function, partial derivatives with respect to temperature give us the density perturbations, Partial derivative with respect to the radius gives us pressure perturbations and gravitational waves. So I want to emphasize this slide because I will come back to this slide at the very end. Okay, so here are the equations that we use. We want to compute the curvature perturbations and the gravitational waves. So this is a metric of space-time including curvature perturbations and gravitational waves in a particular gauge and the linearized Einstein equations for the perturbations tell us that the curvature perturbations are given by the energy density fluctuations. The gravitational waves are given by the off-diagonal Tij perturbations. I didn't write I not equal to J here. Good. So we, the energy density fluctuations are given by the specific heat capacity in string gas cosmology the specific heat capacity has this holographic scaling because we have winding modes. And if you merge all of these formulas, then you get this final answer for the power spectrum of curvature perturbations. So for any scale K, the power spectrum of curvature perturbations is given by this expression. And you see at first sight, it is independent of K. So the conclusion is that the holographic scaling of thermodynamic quantities in the emergent phase has given us a scaling of that spectrum of cosmological perturbations. Now, if you look a little bit more carefully at this formula, you see there's a temperature that arises. And the temperature that arises in this formula is the temperature when this scale K exits the Hubble radius. And there's a very slight temp, uh, K dependence in this temperature. And this gives us the slight red tilt of the spectrum of cosmological perturbations. Again, like for inflation. Now, if you ask what is the amplitude of a power spectrum? Well, we have no free parameters here. We have 
the Planck scale here. We have the string scale here. The temperature is approximately the Hagedorn temperature, again, given by the, by the string scale. So if we look back at the Bible of uh, the of 1980s string theory, the Green, Schwartz, and Witten textbook, they say that uh, string theory phenomenology likes a, a string scale of about 10 to the 17 GV. We stick that in and out we get the right scale for uh, cosmological perturbations. So hopefully I've convinced you that there are other ways to get cosmological fluctuations consistent with observations, not just inflation. We can view gravitational waves. We get, again, a scaling event spectrum for gravitational waves, but unlike for inflation, here we get a very slight blue tilt. And this comes from the fact that this factor is in the numerator, not the denominator. Okay, so now the problem of this string gas cosmology approach is that we had no microphysics for the emergent phase, no equations for the, this emergent phase. So in an attempt to get a microphysics for the emergent phase, we've now turned to matrix theory. Okay, so I'm in the last section of the talk, the section where I'm least confident of because it's string theory. So I'm sure you can give me lots of hard time here. So let me just tell you what we've done. So we start with the BFSS matrix model, Banks, Fischler, Schenker, Susskind. It is a quantum mechanical model, which involves nine N by N Hermitian matrices. We want to take the large N limit. So there's no space. There are no singularities, it's a quantum mechanical model. And this model was proposed as a non perturbative definition of M theory. So this is a Gaussian of this matrix model. There are nine matrices X sub I. There's a covariant derivative term, which involves a 10th matrix. And okay, there's a coupling constant here, there's N. We look at the Toff limit where G square N is kept constant. It's related to the string scale and string coupling constant this way. And okay, you know this better than I do. So I'll just let you read this slide and I'll move on to the next slide. So what we do now is we consider this matrix model in a high temperature state. And at high temperatures, it is known that the bosonic sector of this model is equivalent to the bosonic sector of the IKKT matrix model. It's a different matrix model. That's a model which, does, which involves neither space nor time. It is a matrix model. It involves 10 matrices A super V. It is given by this partition function. So you see, given a partition function, we can calculate correlation functions. Okay. Now these are again Hermitian matrices, so we can diagonalize one of them. We choose to diagonalize a temporal matrix. Now again, so th this is a relationship between the IKKT matrix model and type 2B string theory. Again, you know this connection better than I do. So I'll just leave it here for a couple of seconds and then move on to what we've actually done. So we work in a basis in which A naught is diagonal and the diagonal elements become the emergent time. And in the limit N going to infinity, this is continuous time. So now in, in the I model, it has been shown that in the basis in which A naught is diagonal, the A sub I matrices have elements which decay when you go away from the diagonal. So most of the non-vanishing content of the A I matrices is contained in small n by small n blocks about the uh, diagonal. And I will take small n to be proportional to capital N. So in the limit, the continuum limit, 
capital N going to infinity, small n will also go to infinity. So this is a visualization. A naught is diagonal. These are, this is the emergent time. I order them in increasing order of eigenvalues. Then I will consider my small n to be something like co-moving distance. For each i, I will have an independent co-moving distance scale. And I will, for each of these uh, co-moving distances, small n, I can consider these small n by small n matrices, and I can compute the extent of space, which is defined in terms of the trace of these small n by small n matrices. So here we have the physical extent of space in the i direction. Small n was a co-moving extent. So we might get the emergent metric. But this is double question mark because we haven't really explored this yet. Because all we really knew, use for our calculations is the partition function. So the Minkowski eta mu nu symbol is contained in the, ma in the matrix model. And so therefore local Lorentz invariants will emerge in the continuum limit. Okay, good. So now what's also been shown using uh, Gaussian approximation techniques, sorry, Gaussian expansion techniques and numerical simulations is that only three of these spatial extent parameters become large as a function of the emergent time. So let me go back to this plot. So my emergent time is increasing as I go down the diagonal. I will now look at these n by n blocks as I go down the diagonal. So this gives me the time evolution of space. And of these nine dimensions of space, three become large, six remain small. This is very interesting, especially coming from string gas cosmology, because exactly the same, the same thing happens in string gas cosmology. And in string gas cosmology, we have a nice physical argument for explaining why only three dimensions become large. I'm very interested in connecting the physical picture in string gas cosmology to what is observed mathematically but without great physical insight in these matrix theory computations. Okay, so we will now focus on these three large spatial dimensions and we will go on and compute observables. But to compute observables, we go back and we consider the BFSS matrix model. And we assume, and here I write in red, assume, because we haven't shown it yet rigorously, that the spontaneous symmetry breaking that is observed in the IKKT model also holds in the BFSS model. So we assume that also in the BFSS model, only the three of the nine emergent spatial dimensions become locked. We think that this will work, but we are not yet sure. So take this as an assumption. So now given the assumption, what should be clear that we have all the ingredients ready to compute cosmological observations. Since we have the partition function, we can compute thermal correlation functions, and therefore you can compute the curvature fluctuations and the gravitational waves. And this is what we've done in this paper with Shudo Brahma, who's now in Edinburgh, and with my excellent student, Samuel Laliberté. So again, we take the BFSS model at finite temperature. We take the finite temperature partition function. We take the partial derivative with respect to temperature. That gives us the density perturbations. And we take the derivative with respect to the emergent spatial radii r sub i, and that gives us the pressure fluctuations and the gravitational waves. Okay, so finite temperature partition function, energy function. The energy function takes this form. Uh, now, using we apply the Matsubara frequency expansion and we can 
evaluate this energy function in power series expansion as a function of beta, high temperature, small beta. And so the dominant term is the term that comes from the zero modes and the subdominant term comes from the interactions in the kinetic term. And what we find is that the zero terms, they give rise to a term in the energy function, which is independent of space. And the subdominant terms depend on space, as you see here in, my, in the last line. The last line is blocked for me, but I hope it's not blocked for you. And uh, from this, uh, you take the derivative with respect to temperature, and then you basic, and then from that you compute the density perturbations. And what you find is that this term here gives a Poisson spectrum of density perturbations, something that falls off at large scales. And this term gives us a scaling around spectrum of uh, cosmological perturbations. So the uh, this is what I just said. So the, the term, it's the second term that dominates the infrared. The second term gives us a scaling variant spectrum of curvature perturbations. We can calculate the amplitude. And if we uh, use, if we insert lambda and n in terms of the string uh, units, we get the result that the amplitude of the power spectrum of cosmological perturbations is given by the same expression as we got in string gas cosmology. So essentially string energy scale divided by Planck scale to the fourth power. And we can compute the scaling event spectrum of gravitational waves. And again, we get the scaling event spectrum of gravitational waves with an amplitude which is suppressed by, uh, compared to the density perturbations. Okay, so we get the exciting result that this non perturbative definition of superstring theory might give us emergent space, emergent time, and an emergent early universe phase. And I should mention that the horizon problem is automatically solved because we have no causality problem in the matrix model. The emergent space has causality information over the entire spatial extent because it comes from one particular state of the quantum mechanical matrix model. So naturally, there are lots of problems. We haven't studied the phase transition between the emergent phase and the expanding phase of Big Bang cosmology. And again, this phase transition is something which is very well understood in string gas cosmology, but it is not well understood in our matrix um, cosmology picture. Also, we haven't yet addressed how the flatness problem is solved. Why does the universe that emerges, why is it spatially flat? But I think we can use the same argument as uh, Ruff and collaborators recently used in the context of a topological model for the emergent phase. And related to this, we also haven't shown that the space that emerges has sufficiently large spatial scale. So there are lots of open problems. This is not yet a theory which we presented, but a model which is based on the BFSS matrix model. So I think I've exhausted my time and I want to leave you with the conclusions. So I hope to have convinced you that if we really want to describe the early universe, we cannot use effective point particle field theory. We have to go beyond that. So how we go beyond that, there are many ways. And I've explored one particular way of going beyond this. And this is starting from the BFSS matrix model, which is a proposed non perturbative definition of superstring theory. Then, so uh, we've taken this as a starting point. We considered a high temperature state of this matrix model. And we've argued that in this context, we get emergent time and emergent space. 
And in this context, we've taken this high temperature state, we've computed the thermal fluctuations that result, and we've shown that we get a scaling event spectrum of cosmological perturbations and a scaling event spectrum of gravitational waves. So thanks for listening. Uh, if anyone has any questions. Uh, I have a couple of quick questions, if I may. Uh, Robert, uh, one question I have has to do with the uh, relationship between a uh, matrix model you talked about and 11 dimensional supermembrane. I mean, 11 dimensional supermembrane is notoriously difficult to quantize system, but there were attempts in the old days right. to uh, Discretize the world volume and then uh, convert the uh, supermembrane action into something like the model you, you've written down, uh, you talked about. Uh, are you familiar with the relationship? No, actually, I, I've heard that there is such a relationship, but I, and I know that quantizing membranes is very hard. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. but this, what I'm showing here, is what I'm more familiar with, with a way of of uh, getting at the BFSS. If it turns out to be related to, suppose, to uh, supermembrane, mm -hmm. uh, one might ask why, why would that play a special role given that there are all, there's M5 brain, that there are D brains, that there are all sorts of uh, zoo of brains. Why would the 11 dimensional supermembrane play such a central or important well, role? You see, if you come from the BFSS matrix model point of view, then the BFSS matrix model is the starting point and everything follows from there. So oh, you mean you can probe all the web of uh, dualities and so on and so forth? You should, from you should be able to. Right. So one way, uh -huh. let me tell you one thing. So, um, you can see the strings emerging from this matrix model in the following way. You localize, um, you, you take um, the matrices, the spatial matrices, and you take a spatial matrix, which is uh, concentrated at the diagonal on one part of the diagonal. And that will give you something that's a little bit like one string. And then if you look at another uh, matrix, which, uh, which again is concentrated on the diagonal, but it has one clump of non-ranching components, let's say towards the top, one closer to the bottom, then that matrix will describe you two strings. Mm -hmm. So, so, in the, so, so this, this is way, the way that I would visualize things, but again, my apologies, I'm not a string theorist. And what I just said may be completely wrong. You are more an expert than me. <laughs> well, these and are Chris tough are questions well. for anyone probably. But uh, just a quick follow-up question. Uh, what about the um, uh, tensionless limit of string theory? Does that uh, enter anywhere, this picture? Where you probably know that there are conjectures about masses higher spins showing up if the tension goes to zero. Uh, this question is motivated by the fact that you mentioned there are a large number of towers of light string states. That kind of mm -hmm. motivates me to ask this question. Yeah. Okay, now see when I said light, I don't mean zero mass, but I mean comparable in mass to the degrees of freedom that you started out with. Mm -hmm. So for me, these states are not, are not becoming massless. Mm -hmm. So, but the extremely I high energy limit of string theory in the early universe physics doesn't that uh, bring to mind uh, tensionless limit of string theory uh, somehow? Uh, I mean, well, this is not something that I've explored. I see. To to me, to me the the strings always have tension. See, like in the power spectrum, the mm -hmm. tension was there. This. this and also when I look, when I constructed the bouncing setup, uh -huh. I, I needed the tension to be, to be present. In, in your framework, yes, indeed. In I this, remember your formula. 
But no. uh, usually inflation models don't care much about, of course, string tension, right? I mean, <laughs> I guess they don't do string theory anyway. They just do. Yeah, but what I argued is that you... Yeah, yeah well, you are doing string theory. Yes, yeah, string gas. One very last question, I promise. Uh, the fermions never seem to enter these stories in cosmology, ever. Uh, what about, the, I mean, superstring has fermionic sector, right? There's gravitino, which is yes, a they, superpartner they, of they, graviton. How they argue, they, they enter never... here. Sorry? They, they've they? entered here. Where? They've entered in what I skipped, namely, the details of this calculation here. They enter into the forms of chi two and chi one. So what we've done here is we've really taken the BFSS matrix model partition function, including fermions. Oh, I see. And, cal and calculated these derivatives. So oh. fermions are here. Okay, that's gratifying to see. Thank you, Robert. Right. Thank but you. also in this, yeah. where, so when I said this positive point, I should also mention a negative point. Do we, when we, here, when I say we assume that the spontaneous symmetry breaking occurs for the BFSS matrix model, it is, so in the IKKT model, fermions play a crucial role to get the symmetry breaking. Oh. But, but the correspondence between BFSS and IKKT is only well-established neglecting the fermions. Mm. So there's one link here where the fermions are missing. Uh -huh. but, but fermions are definitely involved in many places here in this, in this analysis. Is IKKT model in good standing in the cosmology circles? I mean, is this a well-established result? Do you? No, in the cosmology circle, we are the first people who've considered, oh. well, almost the first people who've considered I see. matrix I see. theory cosmology. I see. And uh, there's been very little work on the IKKT matrix model. You mean and, in, uh, we in, are in touch with, theory literature, you mean? Yes, even. No, in the cosmology. That's in the cosmology, theory. I see, okay. Thank you. Uh, hello, Robert. hello, Robert. Hey. Hi. Uh, is there a technical reason why, why you consider BFSS but not IKKT? Because it's like already giving the spontaneous symmetry breaking. Okay, this is a good question now. Um, so the other, I initially had the prejudice that I wanted time to be present. Mm -hmm. I wanted to have a time in which I can define a high temperature state. But this is not a very good reason. But given the, given the so this was a prejudice that led us to, to start with BFSS. Now the calculations that we've done of the perturbations were done in BFSS. And uh, I'm not sure whether we'd get exactly the same results using IKKT. I think, it would, the answer would be yes. Okay. And, uh, and also, yeah, you have the scale-free spectrum, but uh, is there any distinguishing feature? I mean, is it like exactly what inflation also proposing, like running all the spectrum? Are you having some uh, distinguishing feature right. uh, with the now, spectrum? Right. For string gas cosmology, we, we have the answer. And that was the blue tilt of... Uh, okay the tensor modes. Now, you see here, uh, I didn't talk about the tilt. Yeah. We are not, and the reason why I can't tell you anything about the tilt is that we don't understand the phase transition. Yeah. And the, the understanding of the phase transition in spring gas cosmology was key to us being able to determine the tilt. So we will be able to make predictions with which the model can be distinguished from inflation, but we don't have them yet. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, I think there was a question earlier online from Yanis uh, asking about, um, can you explain what do you mean by a non-conventional non space-time description? 
I think he was asking it in the context of string gas cosmology. Yes. Right. So. So it is this last part of the talk which should have uh, should have answered that question. So the starting point here is an action which doesn't involve space at all. And then I get space in the infinite, in the end going to infinity limb, I get some emergent space. So this is what I meant. Maybe there can be a follow-up if this is not clear. But I see there's a hand up. Please. Thank you, Robert. May, may uh, I ask you, sorry, may, may I ask something? Um, the question, Robert, is the following. Can you repeat me how, where is that happens that uh, six dimensions get small and three gets large? See, three of them get large. Right, so it's actually not that six gets small, but we start with nine small ones. We have SO9 symmetry. And then we evolve into a state where you only where you have SO3 cross SO6 symmetry. And uh, this symmetry breaking is three uh, dimensions becoming large. Good, now, good. in string gas cosmology, there's a very nice physical argument for this. We start with nine, uh, a nine dimensional torus wound by st strings. Now, the only way for the tori to expand is the winding modes have to annihilate. So, and that happens by winding mode, anti-winding mode uh, interactions. But this will not happen in more than three large spatial dimensions because world sheets cannot, cannot find themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in string as cosmology, we have a nice picture. Now in this matrix model, we don't have such a nice picture. We have, um, numerical simulations and uh, Gaussian um, expansion techniques. Mm -hmm. And in the Gaussian expansion techniques, you expand the action about a Gaussian ansatz in which you allow the background, the Gaussian background to have particular characteristics like um, three dimensions different from, from uh, the other six or two mm -hmm. dimensions different from seven. So you make ansatzes for symmetry breaking, and then you compute the free energy as a function of the various ansatzes that you make. Mm -hmm. And then you find that uh, the ansatz that uh, minimizes the free energy is that corresponding to three I see. cross I see. six. I see. As, as a comment, Robert, uh, there is a matrix model called the BMN matrix model. That is basically a mass deformation of, of BF, BFSS. Yes. And has precisely yes. that, that characteristic that you mentioned, has SO6 times SO3 uh, global symmetries, right? So distinguishes three matrices right. from other six. Um, and it's a, it's a very simple mass deformation of the one you can see. Yes, that's on our list of things to do. Good, good, good. All right. Thank you very much. See, it takes us a long time to do this yeah, because yeah, we are not string theorists. Yeah, of course. Good. Thank you very much. Um, there is no other question, then let's thank the speaker again. Thank you for listening. <laughs>